Jabberwocky is a nonsense poem written by Lewis Carroll in his 1871 novel Through the Looking Glass, and What Alice Farmer, a sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The book tells of Alice's adventures within the back-to-front world of a looking glass. In an early scene in which she first encounters the chess piece characters White King and White Queen, Alice finds a book written in a seemingly unintelligible language. Realizing that she is traveling through an inverted world, she recognizes that the verse on the pages are written in mirror writing. She holds a mirror to one of the poems, and reads the reflected verse of Jabberwocky. She finds the nonsense verse as puzzling as the odd land she has passed into, later revealed as a dreamscape. Jabberwocky is considered one of the greatest nonsense poems written in English. Its playful, whimsical language has given English nonsense words and neologisms such as galumphing, and chortle. Origin and Publication A decade before the publication of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and the sequel Through the Looking Glass, Carol wrote the first stanza to what would become Jabberwocky while in Croft on Tees, close to Darlington, where he lived as a child, and printed it in 1855 in Mishmash, a periodical he wrote and illustrated for the amusement of his family. The piece was titled Stanza of Anglo-Saxon Poetry, and read. The rest of the poem was written during Carol's stay with relatives at Itbune, near Sunderland. The story may have been partly inspired by the local Sunderland area legend of the Lambton Worm. The concept of nonsense verse was not original to Carol, who would have known of trip books such as The World Turned Upside Down and stories such as The Great Pawn Jundrum. Nonsense existed in Shakespeare's work and was well known in the Brothers Grimm's fairy tales, some of which are called lying tales or la one quarter gen my currency r c h e n. Roger Lancelin Green suggests that Jabberwocky is a parody of the old German ballad The Shepherd of the Giant Mountains in which a shepherd kills a griffin that is attacking his sheep. The ballad had been translated into English in blank verse by Carol's cousin Manella Butte Smedley in 1846, many years before the appearance of the Alice books. Historian Sean B. Palmer suggests that Carol was inspired by a section from Shakespeare's Hamlet, citing the lines, The graves stood tenantless and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets from Act I, Senior I. John Tenniel reluctantly agreed to illustrate the book in 1871, and his illustrations are still the defining images of the poem. The illustration of the Jabberwock may reflect the contemporary Victorian obsession with natural history and the fast-evolving sciences of paleontology and geology. Stephen Prickett notes that in the context of Darwin and Mantle's publications and vast exhibitions of dinosaurs, such as those at the Crystal Palace from 1845, it is unsurprising that Tenniel gave the Jabberwock the leathery wings of a pterodactyl and the long scaly neck and tail of a sauropod. Lexicon Many of the words in the poem are playful nonce words of Carol's own invention, without intended explicit meaning. When Alice has finished reading the poem she gives her impressions. It seems very pretty, she said when she had finished it, but it's rather hard to understand. Somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas a euro only I don't exactly know what they are. However, somebody killed something, that's clear, at any rate. This may reflect Carol's intention for his readership. The poem is, after all, part of a dream. In later writings he discussed some of his lexicon, commenting that he did not know the specific meanings or sources of some of the words. The linguistic ambiguity and uncertainty throughout both the book and the poem may largely be the point. In Through the Looking Glass, the character of Humpty Dumpty, in response to Alice's request, explains to her the nonsense words from the first stanza of the poem. However, Carol's personal commentary on several of the words differ from Humpty's. For example, following the poem, a wrath is described by Humpty as a sort of green pig. Carol's notes for the original in Mishmash suggest a wrath as a species of badger that lived chiefly on cheese, and had smooth white hair, long hind legs, and short horns like a stag. The appendices to certain looking glass editions, however, state that the creature is a species of land turtle that lived on swallows and oysters. Later critics added their own interpretations of the lexicon often without reference to Carol's own contextual commentary. An extended analysis of the poem and Carol's commentary is given in the book The Annotated Alice by Martin Gardner. 
In 1868 Carroll asked his publishing house Macmillan, have you any means, or can you find any, for printing a page or two in the next volume of Alice in Reverse? It may be that Carroll was wanting to print the whole poem in mirror writing. Macmillan responded that it would cost a great deal more to do, and this may have dissuaded him. In the author's note to the Christmas 1896 edition of Through the Looking Glass Carol writes, the new words, in the poem Jabberwocky, have given rise to some differences of opinion as to their pronunciation, so it may be well to give instructions on that point also. Pronounce Slithy as if it were the two words, sly, they make the G hard in Jaya and Jimble and pronounce Rath to rhyme with Bath. In the preface to The Hunting of the Snark, Carol wrote, Let me take this opportunity of answering a question that has often been asked me, how to pronounce slithy toves. The I in slithy is long, as in writhe, and toves is pronounced so as to rhyme with groves. Again, the first O in borogoves is pronounced like the O in borrow. I have heard people try to give it the sound of the O in worry. Such is human perversity. Possible interpretations of words, Bandersnatch, a swift moving creature with snapping jaws, capable of extending its neck. A banda was also an archaic word for a leader, suggesting that a bandersnatch might be an animal that hunts the leader of a group. Beamish, radiantly beaming, happy, cheerful. Although Carroll may have believed he had coined this word, it is cited in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1530. Borogoove, following the poem Humpty Dumpty, says, Borogoof is a thin shabby looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round, something like a live mop. In explanatory book notes Carol describes it further as an extinct kind of parrot. They had no wings, beaks turned up, made their nests under sundials and lived on veal. In Hunting of the Snark, Carol says that the initial syllable of Borogoof is pronounced as in borrow rather than as in worry. Brillig, following the poem, the character of Humpty Dumpty comments. Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. According to Mishmash, it is derived from the verb to brill or broil. Burbled, in a letter of December 1877, Carroll notes that burble could be a mixture of the three verbs bleat, murmur, and wobble, although he didn't remember creating it. Chortled, combination of chuckle and snort. Frabau, possibly a blend of fair, fabulous, and joyous. Definition from Oxford English Dictionary, credited to Lewis Carroll. Frumous, combination of fuming, and furious. In Hunting of the Snark Carroll comments, T, ache the two words fuming and furious. Make up your mind that you will say both words, but leave it unsettled which you will say first. Now open your mouth and speak. If your thoughts incline ever so little towards fuming, you will say fuming furious. If they turn, by even a hair's breadth, towards furious, you will say furious fuming. But if you have the rarest of gifts, a perfectly balanced mind, you will say frumous. Galumphing, perhaps used in the poem a blend of gallop and triumphant. Used later by Kipling, and cited by Webster as to move with a clumsy and heavy tread, Jimble, Humpty comments that it means to make holes like a gimlet. The setting for spinning objects such as gyroscopes. Gyre, to gyre is to go round and round like a gyroscope. Gyre is entered in the OED from 1420, meaning a circular or spiral motion or form. Especially a giant circular oceanic surface current. However, Carroll also wrote in Mishmash that it meant to scratch like a dog. The G is pronounced like the in gold, not like gem. Jabberwocky. When a class in the girls' Latin school in Boston asked Carroll's permission to name their school magazine the Jabberwock, he replied, the Anglo-Saxon word wicken or wicker signifies offspring or fruit. Taking jabber in its ordinary acceptation of excited and voluble discussion, this would give the meaning of the result of much excited and voluble discussion. Jubja bird, a desperate bird that lives in perpetual passion, according to the butcher in Carroll's later poem The Hunting of the Snark. Jub is an ancient word for a jerkin or a dialect word for the trot of a horse. It might make reference to the call of the bird resembling the sound jub, jub. Manxum, possibly fearsome. A portmanteau of manly, and buxom, the latter relating to men for most of its history. 
or relating to Manx people. Mimsy, Humpty comments that Mimsy is flimsy and miserable. Mumrath, Humpty Dumpty says following the poem, A Rath is a sort of green pig, but Mum I'm not certain about. I think it's short for from home, meaning that they'd lost their way. Carol's notes for the original in Mishmash state, a species of badger, which had smooth white hair, long hind legs, and short horns like a stag, and lived chiefly on cheese. Explanatory book notes comment that mum means to seem grave and a wrath is a species of land turtle. Head erect, mouth like a shark, the front forelegs curved out so that the animal walked on its knees, smooth green body, lived on swallows and oysters. In the 1951 animated film adaptation of the book's prequel, the mum wraths are depicted as small, multi-colored creatures with tufty hair, round eyes, and long legs resembling pipe stems. Outgrab, Humpty says outgribing is something between bellowing and whistling, with a kind of sneeze in the middle. Carol's book appendices suggest it is the past tense of the verb to outgribe, connected with the old verb to grike or shrike, which derived shriek and creak and hence squeak. Slithy, Humpty Dumpty says, slithy means lithe and slimy. Lithe is the same as active. You see it's like a portmanteau, there are two meanings packed up into one word. The original in Mishmash notes that slithy means smooth and active the eye is long, as in writhe. Snicker snack, possibly related to the large knife, the snickered snay. Tov, Humpty Dumpty says tovs are something like badgers, they're something like lizards, and they're something like corkscrews. Also they make their nests under sundials, also they live on cheese. Pronounced so as to rhyme with groves. They gyre and jimble, that is rotate and bore. Tulgy, Carol himself said he could give no source for Tulgy. Could be taken to mean thick, dense, dark. It has been suggested that it comes from the Anglo-Cornish word Tulgu, darkness, which in turn comes from the Cornish language to wallow darkness, gloominess. You fish, Carol noted it seemed to suggest a state of mind when the voice is gruffish, the manner roughish, and the temper huffish. Vorpal, Carol said he could not explain this word, though it has been noted that it can be formed by taking letters alternately from verbal, and gospel. Wabe, the characters in the poem suggest it means the grass plot around a sundial, called a wabby because it goes a long way before it, and a long way behind it. In the original Mishmash text, Carol states a wabe is the side of a hill. Linguistics and Poetics Though the poem contains many nonsensical words, English syntax and poetic forms are observed, such as the quatrain verses, the general abap rhyme scheme and the iambic meter. The linguist Lucas believes the nonsense term is inaccurate. The poem relies on a distortion of sense rather than nonsense, allowing the reader to infer meaning and therefore engage with narrative while lexical allusions swim under the surface of the poem. Parsons describes the work as a semiotic catastrophe arguing that the words create a discernible narrative within the structure of the poem, though the reader cannot know what they symbolize. She argues that Humpty tries, after the recitation, to ground the unruly multiplicities of meaning with definitions, but cannot succeed as both the book and the poem are playgrounds for the carnivalized aspect of language. Parsons suggests that this is mirrored in the prosody of the poem in the tuxel between the tetrameter in the first three lines of each stanza and trameter in the last lines, such that one undercuts the other and we are left off balance, like the poem's hero. Carroll wrote many poem parodies such as Twinkle, Twinkle Little Bat, You Are Old, Father William, and How Doth the Little Crocodile. They have become generally better known than the originals on which they are based, and this is certainly the case with Jabberwocky. The poem's successes do not rely on any recognition or association of the poems that they parody. Lucas suggests that the original poems provide a strong container but Carol's works are famous precisely because of their random, surreal quality. Carol's grave playfulness has been compared with that of the poet Edward Lear. There are also parallels with the work of Gerard Manley Hopkins in the high use of soundplay, alliteration, created language and portmanteau. Both writers were Carol's contemporaries. Translations Jabberwocky has been translated into many languages. The translation might be difficult because the poem holds to English syntax and many of the principal words of the poem are invented. 
translators have generally dealt with them by creating equivalent words of their own. Often these are similar in spelling or sound to carols while respecting the morphology of the language they are being translated into. In Frank L. Warren's French translation, Twas Brillig becomes Il Brilgu. In instances like this, both the original and the invented words echo actual words of Carol's lexicon, but not necessarily ones with similar meanings. Translators have invented words which draw on root words with meanings similar to the English roots used by Carol. Douglas Hofstad to noted in his essay Translations of Jabberwocky, the word slithy, for example, echoes the English slimy, slither, slippery, lithe and sly. A French translation that uses lubricilla for slithy, evokes French words like lubrify to give an impression of a meaning similar to that of Carol's word. In his exploration of the translation challenge, Hofstadter asks, what if a word does exist, but it is very intellectual sounding and Latinate, rather than earthy and Anglo-Saxon? Perhaps hyalus would be better than lubricilla? Or does the Latin origin of the word lubricilla not make itself felt to a speaker of French in the way that it would if it were an English word? Hofstadter also notes that it makes a great difference whether the poem is translated in isolation or as part of a translation of the novel. In the latter case the translator must, through Humpty Dumpty, supply explanations of the invented words. But, he suggests, even in this pathologically difficult case of translation, there seems to be some rough equivalence obtainable, a kind of rough isomorphism, partly global, partly local between the brains of all the readers. In 1967, D. G. Olovskaya wrote a popular Russian translation of Jabberwocky entitled Bar Maglet. She translated Bar Maglet for Jabberwock, Brandashmik for Bandersnatch while Mumsiki echoes Mimsy. Full translations of Jabberwocky into French and German can be found in the annotated Alice along with a discussion of why some translation decisions were made. Chao Yuan Ren, a Chinese linguist, translated the poem into Chinese by inventing characters to imitate what Rob Gifford of National Public Radio refers to as the slithy tobes that jired and jimbled in the way Bob Carroll's original. Satyajit Ray, a filmmaker, translated the work into Bengali in concrete poet Augusto de Campos created a Brazilian Portuguese version. There is also an Arabic translation by Wael El Mardi, and at least two into Serbo-Croatian. Multiple translations into Latin were made within the first weeks of Carroll's original publication. Some translations, reception, according to Chesterton and Green and others, the original purpose of Jabberwocky was to satirize both pretentious verse and ignorant literary critics. It was designed as verse showing how not to write verse, but eventually became the subject of pedestrian translation or explanation and incorporated into classroom learning. It has also been interpreted as a parody of contemporary Oxford scholarship and specifically the story of how Benjamin Jowett, the notoriously agnostic professor of Greek at Oxford, and master of Balliol, came to sign the 39 Articles, as an Anglican statement of faith, to save his job. The transformation of audience perception from satire to seriousness was in a large part predicted by G. K. Chesterton, who wrote in 1932, Poor, poor, little Alice. She has not only been caught and made to do lessons. She has been forced to infect lessons on others. It is often now cited as one of the greatest nonsense poems written in the English language, the source for countless parodies and tributes. In most cases the writers have changed the nonsense words into words relating to the parodied subject, as in Frank Jacobs' As If Lewis Carroll Were a Hollywood Press Agent in the 30s in Mad for Better or Verse. Other writers use the poem as a form, much like a sonnet, and create their own words for it as in Strong Clemis by S. K. Azuli or the poem O. Fredel Grunt Berkeley recited by Prostitnik Bogon Gelts and Douglas Adams The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a book which contains numerous other references and homages to Carol's work. Some of the words that Carol created such as chortled, and galumphing have entered the English language and are listed in the Oxford English Dictionary. The word Jabberwocky itself has come to refer to nonsense language. In other media, a song called Beware the Jabberwock was written for Disney's Alice in Wonderland, to be sung by Stan Freberg with the Ritham Ayres and Doris Butler. Written by Don Ray and Jean de Paul, it was a musical rendition of the Jabberwocky verse. The song was not included in the final film, 
but a demo recording was included in the 2004 and 2010 DVD releases of the movie. In the final release, the character of the Kesai Cat sings the first few lyrics of the Jabberwocky poem when Alice encounters him. The poem was a source of inspiration for Terry Gilliam's 1977 film, Jabberwocky. The Jabberwocky character appears in Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, voiced by Christopher Lee. The Jabberwocky is featured in Once Upon a Time in Wonderland played by Peter Sargent. The Jabberwocky was also the basis of a skit performed on The Muppet Show. British musician Donovan put the poem to music in the song of the same name on his album HMS Donovan in 1971. The stage musical Jabberwocky by Andrew Kay, Malcolm Middleton and Peter Phillips, follows the basic plot of the poem. The American folk group The 3Ds recorded a version in 1964 and included it on their New Dimensions in Folk Songs album. The poem was cited as the inspiration for Jabberwocky 2014, a festival collaboration between ATP, Pitchfork, Primavera Sound and Lloyd's TSB, headlined by psych folk band Neutral Milk Hotel and producer James Blake. See also Jabba, the Jabberwocky engine, works influenced by Alice in Wonderland, references. Sources, Carpenter, Humphrey Secret Gardens, The Golden Age of Children's Literature. Horton Mifflin. ISBN 0-395-35293-2, further reading, Alec Howgut, Karen. Carol's Jabberwocky. Explicator, Fall 1987. Volume 46, Issue 1. Borchers, Melanie. A Linguistic Analysis of Lewis Carroll A Euro Unregistered Trademark S Poem A Euro Jabberwocky A Euro Unregistered Trademark. The Carolian, The Lewis Carroll Journal. Autumn 2009, Number 24, Pages 3 A Euro 46. Isner 1462-6519, Dalitsky, Marlene. Under the Tumptum Tree, From Nonsense to Sense. A Study in an Automatic Comprehension. J. Benjamin's Pub Company. Amsterdam, Philadelphia, Gardner, Martin. The Annotated Alice, The Definitive Edition. New York, New York, W. W. Norton and Company. Green, Roger Lancelin. The Lewis Carroll Handbook, Jabberwocky, and Other Parodies A Dawson of Paul Mal, London, Hofstadter, Douglas A Translations of Jabberwocky. Gar Paragraph Dell, Escher, Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid. New York, New York, Vintage Books. ISBN A 0 394 7 A, Lucas, Peter J. Jabberwocky Back to Old English, Nonsense, Anglo Saxon and Oxford in Language History and Linguistic Modeling. ISBN 978 3 11 014504 5. Richards, Fran. The Poetic Structure of Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky, The Journal of the Lewis Carroll Society 81. 16 a Euro 19. External links, Essay, Translations of Jabberwocky. Douglas R. Hofstadter, 1980 from Gar Paragraph Dell, Escher, Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid ISBN 0-394-74502-7. Vintage Books, New York, NY, BBC Video, Jabberwocky Read by English actor Brian Blessed, Poetry Foundation Biography of Lewis Carroll, The Lewis Carroll Journal published by the Lewis Carroll Society.